fractured world, India presents a bright image of dynamism, of optimism, and promise. India is the world's largest democracy. With more than 1.3 billion people, India will be the most populous country within the next decade. India's unique demographic dividend, rising tide of entrepreneurial spirit, breakthrough innovations in many sectors, and remarkable pace, and the your leadership, Mr. Prime Minister, of bold and structural reforms have boosted the macroeconomic fundamental, uh, uh, fundamentals and enhanced India's long-term economic outlook and, of course, provides a great investor's opportunity. And your leadership, Prime Minister, India is expanding its influence in a wide range of global initiatives, including the Paris Agreement, Climate Agreement, and the International Solar Alliance. India is guiding the world on how high-tech technological advancement, such as space mission, can coexist with grassroots innovation, social entrepreneurship, such as the BHIM mobile app, which is greatly advancing India's digital payment ecosystem. India's philosophy of the world is one family. Vazu, Daiva, Kutum, Bakum, that you often quote is closely aligned to the theme of this year's annual meeting. And today, we all are looking forward to hearing you about your vision for India, for the world, and for India's role in the world. Personally, I would like to thank you for your country's continuous support of the World Economic Forum for nearly four decades. And as evident here in the room, for the strong Indian delegation, which has become a tradition, a delegation of government and business leaders, and for many projects and initiatives, we have your support. And ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome His Excellency, the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. His Excellency. His Excellency, the President of the Swiss Federation, Honorable Heads of the State and Government, Honorable Heads of State and Government, World Economic Forum ke Sanstapak, Founder and Executive Chairman of the World Economic Forum, Mr. Klaus Schwab, senior and eminent entrepreneurs, industrialists, and CEOs from all over the world, my friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am delighted to be here with you in Davos for the 48th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. At the outset, I wish to uh, sincerely commend Professor Klaus Schwab for his vision and initiative and for making the World Economic Forum a premier and global uh, platform. As for his vision, he has also a very ambitious uh, agenda, and the objective of his agenda 
is to improve the state of the world. And uh, he has uh, strongly linked this agenda with uh, economic and uh, political thought. I would also like to express my, my gratefulness to the government and people of Switzerland for the warm welcome and uh, gracious hospitality that has been extended to me. Friends, the last time an Indian Prime Minister was in Davos was in 1997 when Mr. Devi Gowda uh, had uh, come to Davos. In 1997, India's GDP was just a little more than uh, $400 billion. And now, Two decades later, it is about six times that amount. That year, the theme of this forum was building the network society. Today, 21 years later, when we see the achievements of technology and the digital age, then this subject of 1997, it seems that it's a centuries-old subject. It was uh, uh, some, something from an era gone by. Today, we are not just a network society, but... We are living in the world of big data, artificial intelligence, and cobots. In 1997, the euro was not yet a currency that was being used, and the Asian financial crisis was nowhere on the horizon, and nor were there any signs or indications of Brexit. In 1997, very few people had heard of Osama bin Laden, and Harry Potter was also an unknown name. At that time, computer programs were yet to seriously threaten human chess players. In 1997, Google was yet to be launched in cyberspace. And in 1997, if uh, you had done a search on the internet uh, for the word Amazon, most of the results would have been about a river or a thick jungle. At that time, Tweeting was done only by birds, not by human beings. That was the last century. And now, some two decades later, we live in a world, we live in a society that is a network of many complex networks. At that time as well, Davos was obviously ahead of the curve and this World Economic Forum was a precursor for the future. It was indicative of the future. Today as well, Davos is a, a lot ahead of its times. This year, the theme of the forum is uh, creating a shared future in a fractured world. This means that we, in, in a world uh, that is full of fault lines and rifts, we need to build a shared future with the new changes taking place, with the new forces arising, the balance uh, between economic capabilities and political power is changing at great speed. And because of this, 
we can see and foresee far far reaching changes in the nature of this world with respect to peace stability and security the world today is facing many new and uh, many serious uh, challenges and we are experiencing them technology driven transformation technology driven transformation is deeply influencing the way we live the way we work the way we behave the way we talk to each other also influencing international groups politics economics this technology driven world has influenced every aspect of our lives technology has the ability to link to bend to break and i uh, i can say this responsibly technology has the ability to bend break link and a very good example of all these three aspects can be seen in the use of social media today data is the biggest asset so much so that the global flow of data is creating the biggest opportunities and also the greatest challenges we are accumulating mountains and mountains of data there's a race now to be able to gain control of this data because it is believed that he who will be able to control the data he is the one who is going to be able to dominate the world the same way in the area of uh, cyber security and nuclear safety as well the rapidly changing technology and the increase in destructive forces has made our earlier challenges even more serious science technology and economic progress have new dimensions and they have on the one hand the ability to show mankind different avenues that lead to uh, prosperity and on the other hand these changes are also creating fault lines and rifts that can inflict a very painful wound a lot of changes are creating walls and barriers which have made for humanity the path to peace and prosperity not just inaccessible but an uphill and arduous one these fractures these divides these barriers these are due to a lack of development they are due to poverty they are due to unemployment they are due to a lack of opportunities and they are also due to a domination over natural and uh, technical resources in this context some important questions come to mind which require some adequate answers for the legacy for the kind of world we leave for future generations and for the future of humanity is our global order widening these fault lines is it increasing these distances what are the powers that give preference to isolationism as opposed to harmony which give preference to conflicts over cooperation and what are the means that we have available to us today what are the paths that we can follow through which we can eliminate these rifts and these distances <coughs> how can we eliminate these uh, rifts these distances 
and how can we realize the dream of a beautiful shared future? Friends, being a representative of India, of Indianness and Indian heritage, for me, the subject of this forum, the theme of this forum is as contemporary as it is timeless. Timeless because since time immemorial in India, we have only believed in linking people, not in breaking them and not in dividing them. Thousands of years ago, in the first scriptures written in Sanskrit, Indian thinkers said, and which was uh, mentioned as well by Professor Schwab in his speech a short while ago, and that is, Indian thinkers said, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, this means all the world is one family. This means that all of us, we are linked together as one family. Our destiny has a common thread that links all of us. This ideology of Vasudeva Kutumbukam, it is today certainly more meaningful to eliminate all these fault lines and uh, distances. It is very relevant to us today in today's world. However, there is a very serious matter that in order to fight the formidable challenges that we face today in the world, there is a lack of consensus between all of us. Even in a family, there can be, on the one hand, harmony and cooperation. There can also, at the same time, be some differences, some fights. This happens. However, the essence of a family lies in the fact that when there is a common challenge that presents itself, there is a feeling of solidarity and everyone comes together to fight it. And through their solidarity, members of a family become stakeholders in sharing joy and sharing the achievements. But it is a matter of concern that the divisions between us, the rifts, the fault lines between us, they have made these challenges and mankind struggle against them all the more complex and much harder. Friends, Friends the ch challenges that we face today are as numerous as they are daunting. These are very widespread challenges, but because given the shortage of time, I would just like to mention three main challenges since they pose the greatest threat to the survival of human civilization as we know it. The first threat is that of climate change. Glaciers are receding. Ice caps are melting in the Arctic. Many islands are sinking or are about uh, to uh, sink. It is very hot at times and very cold at times. There can be very uh, heavy rainfall and floods or there can be drought. We can see the influence of extreme weather conditions. These are already in uh, evidence. Yesterday, Our uh, Excellency, the President was saying to me that at this time, 
the snowfall that has taken place in uh, Davos, this is more than it has been in the last 20 years. In this situation, we sh sh what should have happened? We should have all come out of our limited, narrow confines, and we should have demonstrated solidarity. But if we honestly ask ourselves, did this happen? And if not, then why? And what can we do? What can we do together that will change the situation, improve the situation? Everyone talks about reducing carbon emissions, but but there are very few people or countries who back their words with their resources to help developing countries to adopt appropriate technology. Very few of them come forward to help. You must have often heard about the, the deep bond that there is between uh, Indian traditions and nature. Our culture, our traditions have often repeated this fact. Thousands of years ago, and I'm not talking about recently, I'm talking about a thousand years ago, our holy scriptures told mankind, they were told, Bhumi Mata, Putro Aham Prutya, Putro Aham Prutya, that means the earth is our God and we, the humans, are children of Mother Earth. If we are children of the earth, then why is there today a war of sorts between us and the earth? Thousands of years ago, in the first Upanishad written in India. It was called the Ishopanishad, one of our scriptures. And in that, our, our, our gurus, our holy men, told their pupils about the changing world. And they had said, and they had given them a maxim, a principle. This means stay in the world and enjoy it, but be frugal, make sacrifices, and don't have greed for somebody else's assets and wealth. Two and a half thousand years ago, Lord Buddha gave consumption as per needs a key place among his principles. The father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, also gave us a trusteeship principle. And he also told us that we need to consume and enjoy uh, things as per our needs. But he was categorically against greed-based exploitation. So it is really something that we must think about. How have we moved from a very frugal consumption to need-based consumption? And then now we are looking at greed-based uh, consumption. Our behavior has been deteriorating. We are only focusing on our own happiness. And we have even exploited nature and the planet for our own desires. We have to ask ourselves, has this been development? Or has this been our downfall? This very bad state of our mind and alarming glimpse of our selfishness why does it not oblige us to introspect? If we think about it, we will find that uh, for the current frightful negative impacts on the environment today, there is a perfect remedy. Ancient Indian philosophies, harmony between man and nature.
Not just that, the overall approach of Indian traditions uh, like yoga and Ayurveda that resulted from this uh, philosophy can not only heal the fractures between the environment and us, but it can also give us physical, mental, and spiritual health and balance. To save the environment and to fight climate change, my government has planned a very big campaign. It has given itself a very ambitious objective. By the year 2022, in India, we want to produce 175 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy. This is a very big target for a country like India. And in the last three years, approximately, we have achieved 60 gigawatts. That means a third of our objective has already been achieved by us. In 2016, India and France had together they had envisioned a new international treaty-based organization. This revolutionary step is today a successful exercise. The International Solar Alliance uh, Initiative, after the necessary treaty ratification processes, has now become a reality. And I'm very pleased that this year, in the month of March, on the joint uh, invitation of the President Macron of France and myself, all the member countries of uh, this alliance will come to New Delhi to participate in the first summit of this alliance. Friends, the second biggest uh, challenge is terrorism. And in this context, you are all well aware of India's concerns and also the increasing and changing nature of the serious threats posed to mankind all over the world. All governments of the world are well aware of these challenges, and therefore I don't want to go into the detail, and neither do I want to take up too much of your time on this topic. I just want to cut it short, and just I want to focus on two aspects related to terrorism. Terrorism is dangerous, <coughs> but equally dangerous is the artificial distinction created between good and bad terrorists. Secondly, the other serious contemporary aspect to which I wish to draw your attention it is that educated, well-to-do youth are being radicalized and getting involved in terrorism. I hope that this forum will discuss solutions to the fault lines created by terrorism and violence and the serious challenges that we are facing today I hope that you will be able to find solutions. Every speaker is going to say something, and that isn't really going to move us forward, friends. Uh, the third uh, challenge, and uh, when I look at this uh, third challenge, I see that many societies and countries are becoming more and more focused on themselves. It feels it feels like the opposite of uh, globalization is uh, happening. The negative impact of this kind of man si mindset and the in wrong priorities cannot be considered less dangerous than climate change or terrorism. In fact, Everyone, everyone is talking about an interconnected world. But we will have to accept the fact 
that globalization is slowly losing its luster. The ideals of the United Nations are even today. Everybody uh, is accepted by all. The World uh, Trade Organization also has wide support. But these global organizations that were created after the Second World War do their structures, their systems, their action plans, do they really reflect even today the aspirations and dreams of mankind and the realities of today? <coughs> Between the old systems of these organizations and today's world, in particular, with respect to the needs of uh, the developing countries, uh, there is a very big gap that is uh, evident. Forces of protectionism are raising their heads against uh, globalization. Their intention is not only to avoid globalization themselves, but they also want to reverse its uh, natural flow. The result of all this is that we get to witness new types of tariff and non-tariff barriers, bilateral and multilateral trade agreements and negotiations have come to a kind of standstill. Most nations have seen a decrease in cross-border financial investment. Further, growth in the global supply chain has also stopped. The solution to this worrisome situation against globalization is not isolation. Its solution is in understanding and accepting change and in formulating agile and flexible policies in line with the changing times. The father of the nation of India, the respected Mahatma Gandhi said, I don't want that the walls and uh, windows of my house to be closed from all directions. I want that the winds of cultures of all countries enter my house with aplomb and go out also. However, I will not accept my feet to be uprooted by these winds. The India of today has adopted this view and thinking of Mahatma Gandhi and with complete self-confidence and fearlessness is welcoming this life partner-like wave from all over the world. Friends, the democracy of India is the basic premise of our country's stable, certain, and sustainable development. For an India which is full of unlimited diversity in terms of religion, culture, languages, dressing styles, and food, democracy is not just a political system, but a life view and a lifestyle. We Indians very well understand the importance of a democratic environment and freedom in changing the plurality of diversity to a unity of cordiality, support, and resolution. In India, democracy not only nurtures our diversity, but also provides the required environment, roadmap, and template for, fulling, for fulfilling the hopes, 
aspirations and expectations of more than 1.25 billion Indians and for their adequate development. Democratic values and inclusive economic growth and development have the power to repair and heal all cracks like Sanjeevani, the life-saving herb. In 2014, 600 million voters of India in 2014, for the first time in 30 years, gave absolute majority to a single political party to form the government in the center. We have not resolved to just develop a limited section of society or just a handful of people. We have resolved to bring development to all. The motto of my government is collective efforts for inclusive growth. Our vision for progress is inclusive. Our mission is also inclusive. This inclusive view is the basis of every policy and every scheme of my government, whether it is about financial inclusion by opening bank accounts for tens of millions of people for the very first time, or providing direct benefit transfer using digital technology for the poor and needy, or our campaign for gender justice, which is save the girl child, educate the girl child. We believe that progress can be called progress and development can truly be called development only when all can partake of it together and when it is for everybody. We are not merely bringing about minor reforms in our economic and social policies. We are bringing about radical changes. The path that we have selected is of reform, perform, and transform. Today, the way we are making our economy easy to invest into is unprecedented. That is the reason that today, investing in India, traveling to India, working in India, manufacturing in India, and exporting your products and services from India to all over the world has become much more easier compared to earlier times. We have pledged to end the license regime from its roots. We are removing red tape and laying the red carpet. Almost all areas of our economy has, have been opened up for foreign direct investment. More than 90% uh, areas of investment are on the automatic approval route. The central and state governments have together brought about hundreds of reforms, more than 1,400 archaic laws that uh, were an obstacle in doing business, in administration, as also in the daily lives of the common man, have been abolished. This has been done in the last three years. We have done away with 1,400 archaic logs, and I'm sure you can imagine how much effort is required in a democratic setup to do this. For the first time in the 70 years of an independent India, a single tax regime, the goods and services tax, which is the GST, has been implemented. 
We are making extensive use of technology to increase transparency and accountability. The business community from all over the world has welcomed our resolve and efforts to transform India. In India, democracy, demography, and dynamism are together realizing development and giving shape to our destiny. Decades of control had restricted the capabilities of Indians and its youth. However, now the courageous policy decisions and effective steps taken by our government has changed the situation radically. The far-reaching and big changes that have taken place and are indeed taking place in India are uh, the sacred song indicating the expectation of 1.25 billion Indians, their efforts and their capacity to accept change and to sing that song, I'm here amongst you all today. Now the people of India, the youth of India, are capable of contributing to the building of a $5 trillion economy by 2025. Not just that, when innovation and entrepreneurship makes them job givers and not just job seekers, you can imagine how many more paths will open up for them, for their country, and for your business. You are all major leaders of the world and are very well aware of the changes that are taking place in the world, the improvement in India's rankings and ratings, and the path that we have chosen for the future. However, more than all of these figures and numbers, what is important is that the people of India have welcomed our policies, our initiatives for bringing changes to their future, and the golden indicators or for a bright future. Giving up subsidies by their own will or reinforcing faith in our policies and reforms in a democratic way at every election. And there are so many more such evidences. All of these confirm widespread acceptance and support of these unprecedented changes in India. Friends, looking at the many fractures and the many cracks in the world, it is necessary that we focus on multiple directions for our shared future. Firstly, it is necessary that the big powers of the world have cooperative relations amongst them. It is necessary that the sense of competitiveness among the major nations of the world does not become a wall between them. We will have to set aside our differences to face these challenges and work together towards a larger vision. There is no way out. Secondly, it has become even more important to adhere to a rules-based international order, especially at a time when we live in a world where changes around us can give rise to uncertainties, 
adherence to international laws and regulations in the right spirit is important and necessary. <coughs> the third important thing is that we need to bring reforms in the major institutions of the world connected with politics, economy, and security. Participation and democratization in these institutions must be done in line with the current situation. The fourth important thing is we will need to bring more speed to the economic progress of the world. In this regard, the recent indicators of economic growth have been encouraging. Technology and digital revolution bring about possibilities of such new solutions which will help us in combating old issues like poverty and unemployment in a new way. Friends, India has always extended a helping hand in such efforts. And it is not just today and not just since its independence. Indeed, it is from ancient times that India has been party to providing support in facing and combating these challenges with everybody. In the last century, when the world had to go through two world war crises without any selfish objectives and without any economic or territorial interests, India stood up for the protection of high ideals of peace and humanity. More than 150,000 Indian soldiers laid their lives for this. <coughs> These, it is these ideals for which, after the establishment of the United Nations, India <coughs> has contributed greatly by sending the largest number of troops to the UN peacekeeping operations. It is these ideals whose inspiration and power encourage us to leave out to help our friendly neighboring countries and humankind in times of their crisis and natural disasters, whether it's the earthquake in Nepal or other natural calamities like floods, uh, cyclones in our friendly neighboring countries. In all of these areas, India has always considered its duty to provide help in the form of a first responder. In Yemen, when violence hit the area and victimized not only Indians, but citizens of many countries, we used our resources and safely evacuated not only Indians, but around 2,000 people of other countries out of Yemen. Despite being a developing nation itself, India has proactively cooperated in development cooperation and capacity building. Whether it's any country in Africa or neighbors of India or the countries of Southeast Asia or the Pacific Islands. In all of these, the outline of our support and our projects are based on the priorities and needs of these countries. Friends, India has never had any political or geographical ambitions. We do not exploit 
the natural resources of any country. In fact, we join hands with that country and along with that country, we bring about development in that country as per their priority. In the Indian subcontinent, hundreds of years of cordial coexistence of diversity has resulted that today we believe in a multicultural world and a multipolar world order. India has proved that democracy, respect for diversity, cordiality, and coordination, cooperation and conversation can indeed get rid of all disputes and cracks. This is a tried and tested formula of India for peace, stability, and development. And it's not just this. A predictable, stable, transparent, and progressive India will continue to be the good news in an otherwise state of uncertainty and flux. An India where enormous diversity exists harmoniously will always be a unifying and harmonizing force, not just for itself and not just for its country. The Indian people and the thinkers of India, the old sages of India from ancient times have said this. This is a shloka in Sanskrit, which means that all should be happy, all should be healthy. There should be welfare for all, and there should be no sadness. This is my dream. This dream has been seen for thousands of years, and they have also shown us how to obtain these ideals and how to realize these dreams. And this path, indeed, if you actually venture on it, is very easy. What I just said in sense, this thousands of year old Indian prayer, it means that we should all to get together and work together. We should all step forward together so that our talent flourishes together and work together so there are no grudges between us. The great poet of India and Nobel laureate from the previous century, Mr. Rabindranath Tagore, had imagined a heaven of freedom, and he said about it, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls. Let's all get together and create this heaven of freedom where cooperation and coordination is there and not divide and fracture. And there should be no place for divide and fracture. Come on, let us all together get rid, make this whole world free of its cracks and unnecessary walls. Friends, I call upon all of you that India and Indians consider the entire world its family. In many countries, there are people of Indian origin, and there are about 30 million Indian origin people living in different parts of the world. When we consider the entire world our family, then, of course, it means that for the world also, we are your family. I seek you. If you want wealth, if you want wellness along with wealth, then you must come to India. If 
you want, if you are seeking wholeness in life along with health, that is totality in life, then you must come to India. If you are seeking peace along with prosperity, then the answer is you must come to India. You must come to India and you will always be welcome in India. I have been given this invaluable opportunity to interact with all of you. I would like to thank the World Economic Forum, Professor Schwab, and to each one of you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Namaste.